Have you ever questioned whether your thoughts are truly your own, or if they've been silently shared with someone miles away? In this lesson, we're diving deep into a concept that challenges everything you've ever known about communication, telepathy. But this isn't about psychic powers or mystical experiences. This is telepathy through the lens of science. We'll explore how some of the world's most respected minds have approached telepathy, not as a fringe belief, but as a phenomenon grounded in scientific investigation. Prepare to be intrigued, as what you're about to learn might just make you reconsider what's possible between minds. Lesson 4 Scientific Telepathy The investigators of the Society for Psychical Research of England started by giving a broad definition of telepathy as follows. Telepathy is the communication of impressions of any kind from one mind to another, independently of the recognized channels of sense. They took the rational position that the actual distance between the projector and the recipient of the telepathic message is not material and that all that is required is such a separation of the two persons that no known operation of the senses can bridge the space between them. They wisely held that telepathy between two persons in the same room is as much telepathy as when the two persons are located at opposite sides of the world. The investigators then ruled out all instances of thought transmission in which there was even the slightest muscular contact between the projector and the recipient. They held that, though there might be genuine telepathy in such cases, nevertheless, there was always the possibility of fraud or collusion, or of unconscious muscular action on the part of the projector. They demanded absolute and actual separation of the two persons, in order that their experiments might be above suspicion. They were wise in this, for while there is undoubtedly a psychic communication in the cases in which there is the slight physical connection between the two persons as I shall point out to you a little further on, Still the element of doubt or suspicion must be entirely eliminated from a scientific test in order to render it valuable and valid. They therefore confined their investigations in telepathy to the two following classes, vidlicet, one, where actions are performed without physical contact with the person willing and two, where some number, word, or card is guessed apparently without any of the ordinary means of communication. The investigators recognized the possibility that in the first of the above-mentioned two classes of experiments there is a possibility of suspicion of collusion, fraud, or unconscious suggestion in the matter of the motion of the eyes of the party, or some member of it, which might be seized upon, perhaps unconsciously by the recipient, and used to guide him to the object which was being thought of by the projector or the party. They sought to obviate this difficulty by blindfolding the percipient and by placing non-conductors of sound over his ears. But finally they came to the conclusion that even these precautions might not prove sufficient and, accordingly, they devoted their attention to the second class of experiments, in which all ordinary means of communication between projector and recipient were impossible. They took the additional precautions of limiting their circle to a small number of investigators of scientific reputations and well known to each other, always avoiding a promiscuous company for obvious reasons. One of the earliest series of investigations by these special committees of investigators was that of the family of the Reverend A.M. Creary, in Derbyshire, England. The children of this family had acquired a reputation in what was known as the guessing game in which one of the children, previously placed outside of the room, then returned to the room and attempted to guess the name or location of some object agreed upon by the party during her absence. The results were very interesting, and quite satisfactory, and have frequently been referred to in works on the subject written since that time. I think it well to give the results of this series of experiments in some little detail, for they form a basis for experiments on the part of those who read these lessons. Professor W. F. Barrett, Professor of Physics in the Royal College of Science for Ireland, conducted the most of the experiments. The report to the Society says we began by selecting the simplest objects in the room then chose names of towns, people, dates, cards out of a pack, lines from different poems, etc., in fact anything or series of ideas that those present could keep in their minds steadily. The children seldom made a mistake. I have seen seventeen cards chosen by myself named right in succession without any mistake. We soon found that a great deal depended on the steadiness with which the ideas were. Kept before the minds of the thinkers, and upon the energy with which they willed the ideas to pass, I may say that this faculty is not by any means confined to the members of one family it is much more general than we imagine. To verify this conclusion, I invited two of a neighbor's children to join us in our experiments with excellent results. The report gives the methods of the experiments, as follows the inquiry has taken place partly in Mr. Creary's house, 
and partly in lodgings or at a hotel occupied by some of our number. Having selected at random one child, whom we desired to leave the room and wait at some distance, we would choose a pack of cards or write on a piece of paper a name of a number which occurred to us at the moment. Generally, but not always, this was shown to the members of the family present in the room, but no one member was always present. And we were sometimes entirely alone. We then recalled the child, one of us always assuring himself that, when the door was suddenly opened, she was at a considerable distance, though this was usually a superfluity of caution. As our habit was to avoid all utterances of what was chosen, on re-entering she stood, sometimes turned by us with her face toward the wall, oftener with her eyes directed toward the ground, and usually close to us and remote from the family for a period of silence varying from a few seconds to a minute till she called out to us some number, card, or whatever it might be. In the first experiments, in guessing the name of objects, the child guessed correctly six out of fourteen. She then guessed correctly the name of small objects held in the hands of one of the committee, five times out of six. She guessed fictitious names chosen by the committee, five out of ten, at the first trial. The committee then tested her by writing down the name of some object in the house, fixed at random, and then, after all had thought intently of the thing they sent for the child and bade her try to find the thing thought of, the thought concentration of course continuing during the search. The result is thus reported in this way I wrote down, among other things, a hairbrush, it was brought an orange, it was brought a wine glass, it was brought an apple, it was brought and so on, until many objects had been selected and found by the child. Passing over the details of many other experiments we find that the following remarkable results were obtained by the committee altogether, 382 trials were made in this series, in the case of letters of the alphabet, of cards and of numbers of two figures. The chances of success on a first trial would naturally be 25 to 1, 52 to 1, and 89 to 1, respectively in the case of surnames they would of course be infinitely greater. Cards were far most frequently employed, and the odds in their case may be taken as a fair medium sample, according to which, out of a whole series of 382 trials, the average number of successes at the first attempt by an ordinary guesser would be 7 and one third of our trials, 127 were successes on the first attempt, 56 on the second, 19 on the third, making 202 out of a possible 382. Think of this. While the law of averages called for only seven and one-third successes at first trial, the children obtained 127, which, given a second and third trial, they raised to 202. You see, this takes the matter entirely out of the possibility of coincidence or mathematical probability. But this was not all. Listen to the further report of the committee on this point. The following was the result of one of the series. The thing selected was divulged to none of the family. And five cards running were named correctly on a first trial. The odds against this happening once in a series were considerably over a million to one. There were other similar batches, the two longest runs being eight consecutive guesses, once with cards and once with names, where the adverse odds in the former case were over 142 millions to one and in the other, something incalculably greater. The opinion of eminent mathematicians who have examined the above results is that the hypothesis of mere coincidence is practically excluded in the scientific consideration of the matter. The committee calls special attention to the fact that in many of the most important tests none of the creary family were cognizant of the object selected, and that, therefore, the hypothesis of fraud or collusion is absolutely eliminated. The committee naturally came to the conclusion that the phenomena was genuine and real telepathy. Professor Balfour Stewart, LLD FRS, who was present at some of these experiments, though not a member of the committee, expressed great amazement at some of the results, he reports. The thought reader was outside a door. The object or thing thought of was written on paper and silently handed to the company in the room. The thought reader was then called in, and in the course of a minute the answer was given. Definite objects in the room, for instance, were first thought of. And in the majority of the cases the answers were correct. Then numbers were thought of, and the answers were generally right, though, of course, there were some cases of error. The names of towns were thought of, and a good many of these were right. Then fancy names were thought of. I was asked to think of certain fancy names and mark them down and hand them round to the company. I thought of and wrote on paper Bluebeard, Tom Thumb, Cinderella, and the answers were all correct. The committee also conducted a number of experiments with other recipients, with very satisfactory results. Colors were correctly guessed with a percentage of successes quite beyond the average or probable number. Names of towns in all parts of the world were correctly guessed by certain recipients with a wonderful degree of success, but probably most wonderful of all was the correct reproduction of diagrams of geometrical and other figures and shapes. 
In one case, the recipient, in a series of nine trials, succeeded in drawing them all correctly, except that he frequently reversed them, making the upper side down and the right-hand side to the left. The Society has published these reproduced diagrams in its illustrated reports, and they have convinced the most skeptical of critics. Some of the diagrams were quite complicated, unusual, and even grotesque, and yet they were reproduced with marvelous accuracy, not in a hesitating manner, but deliberately and continuously, as if the recipient were actually copying a drawing in full sight. Similar results have been obtained by other investigators who have followed the lead of these original ones. So you see, the seal of scientific authority has been placed upon the phenomena of telepathy. It is no longer in the realm of the supernatural or uncanny. As Camille Flammarion, the eminent French scientist, has said the action of one mind upon another at a distance, the transmission of thought, mental suggestion, communication at a distance, all these are not more extraordinary than the action of the magnet on iron. The influence of the moon on the sea, the transportation of the human voice by electricity, the revolution of the chemical constituents of a star by the analysis of its light, or, indeed, all the wonders of contemporary science. Only these psychic communications are of a more elevated kind and may serve to put us on the track of a knowledge of human nature. What is certain is that telepathy can and ought to be henceforth considered by science as an incontestable reality that minds are able to act upon each other without the intervention of the senses that psychic force exists, though its nature is yet unknown. We say that this force is of a psychic order, and not physical, or physiological, or chemical, or mechanical, because it produces and transmits ideas and thoughts, and because it manifests itself without the cooperation of our senses, soul to soul, mind to mind. In addition to investigating the above-mentioned classes of telepathic phenomena, the English Society for Psychical Research investigated many remarkable cases of a somewhat higher phase of telepathy. They took down the stories told by persons deemed responsible, and then carefully examined and cross-examined other witnesses to the strange phenomena. The record of these experiments and investigations fill a number of good-sized volumes of the Society's reports, which are well worth reading by all students of the subject. They may be found in the libraries of nearly any large city. I shall, however, select a number of the most interesting of the cases therein reported, to give my students an idea of the character of the phenomena so investigated and found genuine by the committees having this class of telepathy under investigation. Interesting case of spontaneous telepathy is that related by Dr. Ede, as follows there is a house about a half mile from my own, inhabited by some ladies, friends of our family. They have a large alarm bell outside their house. One night I awoke suddenly and said to my wife, Lamb sure I hear Mrs. F's alarm bell ringing after listening for some time we heard nothing and I went to sleep again. The next day Mrs. F called upon my wife and said to her we were wishing for your husband last night, for we were alarmed by thieves. We were all up, and I was about to pull the alarm bell, hoping that he would hear it, saying to my daughters, I am sure it will soon bring Dr. Aid, but we did not ring it my wife asked what time this had happened. And Mrs. F said that it was about half past one. That was the time I awoke thinking that I heard the bell. In this case there was manifested simply ordinary physical plane telepathy. Had the bell actually been rung and heard psychically, it would have been a case of astral plane hearing, known as clairaudience. As it was, merely the thought in the mind of Mrs. F., and her strong idea to ring the bell, caused a transmission of thought waves which struck Dr. Ede with great force and awakened him. This case is interesting because it is typical of many cases of a similar nature within the experience of many persons. It is seen that a strong feeling, or excitement, accompanied by a strong desire or wish to summon another person, tends to give great power and effect to the thought waves emitted. They strike the mind of the recipient like the sudden ringing of an alarm clock bell. Another interesting case is that of two ladies, both well known to members of the committee, and vouched for as of strict veracity. This case is unusual for the reason that two different persons receive the thought waves at the same time. Here is an abridgment of the case Lady G and her sister had been spending the evening with their mother, who was in her usual health and spirits when they left her. In the middle of the night the sister awoke in her fright and said to her husband I must go to my mother at once. Do order the carriage. I am sure that she is taken ill on the way to her mother's house, where two roads meet she saw Lady G's carriage approaching. When they met each asked the other why she was there. They both related the same experience and impression. When they reached their mother's house, they found that she was dying and had expressed an earnest wish to see them. Another case of a similar nature is this at the siege of Multan, Major General R., then adjutant of his regiment, was severely wounded and supposed himself to be dying. He requested that his ring be taken off his finger and sent to his wife. 
At the same time his wife was at Ferozepur, 150 miles distant, lying on her bed, in a state halfway between waking and sleeping. She saw her husband being taken off the field, and heard his voice saying, Take this ring off my finger, and send it to my wife. This case bears the marks of very strong telepathy, but also has a suspicious resemblance to clairvoyance accompanied by clairaudience. Or perhaps it is a combination of both telepathy and clairvoyance. It is impossible to determine which, in absence of more detailed information. The message of persons dying or believing themselves to be approaching death are frequently very strong, for certain reasons well known to occultists. But there is nothing supernatural about the phenomena, and in most cases it is merely a case of strong telepathy. The Society also reports the following interesting case A, was awake and strongly willed to make himself known to two friends who at that time one o'clock in the morning were asleep, when he met them a few days afterward. They both told him that at one o'clock they had awakened under the impression that he was in their room. The experience was so vivid that they could not go to sleep for some time, and looked at their watches to note the time. Cases of this kind are quite common, and many experimenters have had equally good results with this phase of thought transference. You will remember that there is no actual projection of the astral body, in most of these cases but merely a strong impression caused by concentrated thought. Another interesting case is that of the late Bishop Wilberforce, and is recorded in his biography, as follows the bishop was in his library at Cuttleson, with three or four of his clergy with him at the same table. The bishop suddenly raised his hand to his head, and exclaimed, I am certain that something has happened to one of my sons it afterwards transpired that just at that time his eldest son's foot was badly crushed by an accident on board his ship, the son being at sea. The bishop himself recorded the circumstance in a letter to Miss Noel, saying it is curious that at the time of his accident I was so possessed with the depressing consciousness of some evil having befallen my son, Herbert, that at the last. I wrote down that I was unable to shake off the impression that something had happened to him, and noted this down for remembrance there is nothing unusual about this case, for it has been duplicated in the experience of many persons. Its chief importance lies in the fact that it is recorded by a man of wide reputation and high standing, and also that the bishop had taken the precaution to note down the thing at the time, instead of merely recalling it after he had heard of the accident. You will notice that in many cases of this kind the phenomenon closely approaches the aspect of true clairvoyance, or astral sensing. In some cases there appears to be a blending of both telepathy and astral clairvoyance. In fact, there is but very little difference between the highest phases of ordinary telepathy and the more common phases of clairvoyance. Here, as in many other cases of nature's forces, there seems to be a gradual blending, rather than a sharp dividing line between the two classes of phenomena. Moreover, the student developing his telepathic powers will frequently find that he is beginning to unfold at least occasional flashes of clairvoyance. In the case of telepathy, the recipient merely senses what is in the mind of the projector. In some cases, a picture in the mind of the projector may be seen by the recipient and may thus be mistaken for a case of pure clairvoyance. But, in investigating closely, it will be found that the real scene was slightly different from the impression, in which case it shows that the impression was simply telepathic. Clairvoyant vision shows the scene as it really is, or rather as the physical eye of the recipient would have seen it. The astral sight really sees the scene and does not merely receive the mental impression of the projector. The first is original seeing the second, merely a reproduction of images already in the mind of the projector and colored by his personality, etc. In the next lesson I shall give you a number of exercises and methods designed to develop your telepathic powers. You will find the practice of these most interesting and entertaining, and at the same time most instructive. You will find that as you practice the exercises given therein, you will become more and more adept and proficient in producing telepathic phenomena. From the lower stages you will be able to proceed to the higher. And in time you will be surprised to find that almost unconsciously you have passed into the stage in which you will have at least occasional manifestations of clairvoyance, psychometry, etc. In fact, there is no better way known to practical occultists to develop in a student the powers of clairvoyance than just this method of starting the student with the exercises designed to develop the telepathic power. It has been found by centuries of experience that the student who develops telepathic power, in a systematic way, will gradually unfold and evolve the clairvoyant and psychometric power. It constitutes the first rungs on the ladder of psychic development. Of course, under the head of clairvoyance, etc., you will be given methods and exercise designed to develop clairvoyant powers, some of them very valuable and effective methods at that. But notwithstanding this, I feel that I should impress upon you the importance of laying a firm foundation for such instruction by developing yourself first along the lines of telepathic power. 
Such a course will not only keenly sharpen your powers of receptivity to such vibrations as you may wish to receive, but it will also train your mind in the direction of translating, interpreting, and recording such impressions when received. You must remember that proficiency in a mental art is attained only by means of training the attention to concentrate upon the task. It is the same way in clairvoyance and psychometry. Telepathy trains your attention to concentrate upon the reception of impressions and to hold them firmly and clearly in consciousness. The result is that when you really develop clairvoyant receptivity, your attention has already been trained to do the necessary work. I need not tell you what an advantage this gives you over the clairvoyant who has not received this training, for your own good common sense will assure you of it. So, now for our training in telepathy, not only for itself but also as a means of preparing for the higher stages. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.